each level of illusion, each level of unreality that takes us away from our true being as a soul, limits our experience, does not enhance it. So we are living in a big cage, cage within a cage. We got a large cage, we could move freely, then we got a smaller cage in the cage, we got restricted, then now we are in a very tight cage, this physical body. Such a tight cage, we can do nothing. And yet we glorify ourselves. Boy, I am a great guy, got a per body I have got. We are praising our cage all the time. The very cage in which we are trapped and we can't fly, we can't do things, we can't see beyond our eyes. This cage, this restriction, we are praising. And looking in the mirror saying, great, great. Put some more lipstick, some new cosmetics. I mean, we are trying to beautify the cage. We are not trying to beautify ourselves. We are not trying to find ourselves. We are trying to beautify the cage and live here permanently. And we never live permanently. People who are trying to beautify themselves die every day. So many people we knew, they were busy beautifying themselves, acquiring things for this cage, adding more things to the cage, tying them up. Automobiles, automobiles, homes, houses, property, books, literature, ideas, schools, degrees, PhDs. They added on to these cages, all these, and then died. Nothing happened. The cage was left here. We are wasting our time. We are doing what a person who goes to sleep in a dream would do by trying to beautify things that he saw in a dream. Supposing you go to sleep and have a dream, you say, boy, that's a beautiful mansion I've got, a nice room there. I don't have the right carpet for that. So you wake up and go to the store to find a carpet for your dream house. You don't do it. Because you know it's a dream house. You don't waste your time buying a carpet for a dream house. You buy a carpet for a real home. In this case, we know, anybody who meditates and goes within knows this is not the real world. And we are wasting all our attention and time in beautifying things that are here rather than embellishing things that are permanent and part of our permanent life and our permanent home. Our permanent home is the home of the spirit. Our permanent home is the home of the soul which is above the mind, the senses and the body. Our permanent home is accessible to us right now while we are in this body. Our permanent home is not accessible to us if we are a dog or a horse or a cow because we cannot seek, we cannot go towards that home. Our permanent home is not accessible to us if we are an angel flying in the heavens because the angels know everything, they can do nothing about it. Our permanent home can only be accessed in a human form when we are ignorant because of our human nature and yet we have the capacity to seek. We want to find, we want to knock at the door and see what's behind that. Only when we are in that state that we want to find, we want to seek, we want to choose to seek and knock at the door can we find our true home. And that ability to knock and find is only possible in the human form of life. No wonder it's called the top of all creation. No wonder this is the likeness of the ultimate creator. So this is this is the whole short subject of the teachings of the perfect living masters. If you want to find your own self and your true home where you are right now, you can discover that by gradually shedding all these layers of illusions upon yourself. That I am this body, I am the astral body, I am the causal body, I am a mind. All these are illusions. You are not none of these, you are the soul. You are a permanent soul living in such khand in permanent home right now, but with all these masks put around you, you don't know where you are. It doesn't mean that when you remove these illusions, you come back into reality. You are in reality, but you are covering them up. It's like a, it's a light bulb. You take a light bulb and you put it on. The light is on. It's 100 candle power. It's pretty good light. We see the light. And then you say, okay, it's nice light, but I want to put that little one of those magical rings that with the warmth of the bulb goes round and round. Have you seen that? Sometimes they use it in these discos and all. And different colored lights, they all go round and round. You say, boy, look at this light, it's going round and round. The light is not going round and round. It's the outer cover that makes that motion possible. The light is still as stationary as ever. It's the outer cover that makes it go round and round. And then you put more holes and more colors into that. You say, boy, it's got red and white and small and big holes, now all those are moving. The light doesn't have any holes or any colors at all, it's the cover, the second cover on it. And then you take a shopping bag 
brown bag and put it on top of that, you say, oh, the light has gone away. The light has gone nowhere. It's still there. You put a big bag on it. That's why you can't see. This is our state right now. We are put in, putting a to the beautiful light of our soul, to the beautiful illumination coming from consciousness itself, the beautiful capacity to experience anything one wants to, which comes from consciousness, from the soul. On that we put a mind that gives us a go round, round and round, round and round. We are going round and round, birth after birth, experience after experience, different forms, rebirth, reincarnation. It's not true. It doesn't, reincarnation is not of the soul, never. Reincarnation is of the mind. And we put the mind on top of the soul and the soul's light shines as if it is going through these reincarnations. And you put more holes and colors in that. So you, now I can see, now I can hear. There is no difference between seeing and hearing you are experiencing. What makes it different that these are different sense perceptions is the astral form, the sensory body put on top of it. And looks like all these are separate. Well, we are, we are in a bad state that with this sensory body and with the physical body, we can't see music. We can only hear it. We can't hear light. We can only see it. It's a pity. We closed our doors. You take these two bodies off and you can see music and you can hear light as easily as one and the other. There's no difference. Each experience is capable of full absorption by the consciousness. These are artificial divisions by the outer body. And then you put the big bag on it, which is our physical body. You put the physical body, there's no light inside. Where's the light? The light is still shining. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to say, where is the light? The fact you can say, where is the light, means the light is still shining. You can't see it because of this big brown bag, this body on us. How do we get over this? Reverse this process. Like you put all these covers on top of the light, start taking them off. Become unaware of this body and you see the light again shining through pure senses. Take the sensory body off, you see it shining beautifully and going around. Take the mental cover off and you see the light was always shining. You did not plant the light when you took the covers off. The light was always there. You only removed the covers. That immortal soul in our own home where we are right now has always existed, still exists, will always exist. It's the cover that are not letting us see that. When we remove the colors, covers, we discover the reality. We do not go to a reality. The spiritual journey looks like a journey because we are used to these terms. Journeys from Boston to Chicago. You leave one point, you go to another point or come back from there to this point. This is a different journey. This is not a journey from here to there. This journey is from illusion to reality. This journey is giving up what being us real from appearances of reality to actual reality. That's a different course. And all of it takes place in one beautiful, timeless, spaceless spot we call consciousness. Consciousness does not travel in time. Time is created as a cover upon consciousness. Consciousness does not leave and go anywhere. There is nowhere where this where or that where or here and there are all created outside of consciousness. They are illusions. All illusions have been loaded upon consciousness. And we start talking from the language of illusions. When we want to talk of consciousness, we want to talk of soul, so we say soul travel. People say, oh, I had soul travel, I could fly and go. They are talking of astral body travel, not soul travel. Soul doesn't need to travel because all travel are part of the soul's inner experience. Every experience ever generated is an inner experience of the soul that never travels anywhere. doesn't need to travel. It can create all experiences within itself. It's a great experience to find out that you have a naked soul and all these garments did not let you know who you were. It's a great experience. But even after seeing the soul in its full light compared to the physical world, it actually shines even in, even in perception, even in spiritual perception. It shines. If you were to put 16 suns of the solar universe, this sun that we see in the sky together, that's the light of one soul. And there are billions and trillions of souls all together. And each one has a beautiful island in our own home. Go and see it. We are there. Those beautiful places are there. And we can dance and sing and enjoy and be in bliss forever because all the troubles and unhappiness is coming by not being there. 
with all the illusion that we put upon ourselves. The soul has a beautiful home and a beautiful place. That's where we should be. In fact, we are there and not enjoying it. It's a double tragedy. If we had to go there, one could understand it. We are already there and not enjoying the bliss of that place. So, we should remove the illusions by practice of going within our own consciousness <coughs> and discovering the self. Then we can have the experience of the soul. But the final experience of the soul is even more beautiful. It's not a 16 sun light and so many souls. That again is illusion. That's a spiritual illusion. These were mental, astral and physical illusions. Now I'm going to talk to you about the spiritual illusion. The spiritual illusion is that we are so many souls. That's illusion because there is only one soul. And the illusion of the many is being created within the one soul. There are many drops of water in an ocean. There's one ocean, but all the drops are still in the ocean. That's the situation. We have experience of an individuated soul, a separated soul, not separated in time, not separated in space because there is no time and space, separated in consciousness, as if there's an individual consciousness. The truth is the individuated consciousness seeking its own totality is the real spiritual path. My master was a perfect living master. Great master. He used to tell me, I for the sake of other people start teaching meditation from here. My true spiritual journey starts from the soul, individuated soul to its totality. That's the real spiritual journey. The spiritual journey is within the spirit. The spiritual journey is when the individuated soul realizes that it's always been the total and individuation is an illusion. That's the final stage of removing the illusion and discovering the totality of consciousness has always been the only reality. And all drama of illusions took place within it. Who can find it? Any one of us can find it. What will we discover? That we were really the same. We took on different illusions and took on different roles and came up upon this experience here. And boy, isn't it great to be able to go back from this experience? Even to be able to conceive that such a thing exists. To conceive that we have a way of going back and to actually have experiences that show that we are on our way back to the removal of illusion and to our true home is beyond the explanations any empirical material scientist has ever given of the nature of consciousness. It's not possible. Therefore, once these perfect living masters came and talked to us about it and talked with authority, they didn't talk like philosophers. They didn't say, well, maybe this is possible. They were not professors. Could be, but they didn't join universities because universities would fire them as crazy people. <laughs> but these people who had direct knowledge of the self, they talked with authority from their own experience, not from hypothesis and not from a philosophy. That is why they talked with authority. And we saw in their talk and their authority a position they took that was worth examining. And they didn't say, follow us blindly. They said, do not accept anything except when it comes and is verified by your own experience. A very different stand they took from all the cults and all the psychics who came around us and said, no, believe on it, believe this. Whether you like it or not, believe it. Whether you see it or not, believe it. They didn't talk like that. They said, don't believe anything unless you see and experience yourself. And go stage by stage, step by step, and see the same way you are going on the same path, on the same way that we have already gone. They showed the way and we followed that path and found the same destination. This is the way of the perfect living masters. I have taken too long a time in giving you a description of all this. Are you in heaven? Are you in the body? Are you in the head? Are you in Boston? In Brockton? Where are you? That's the question that still remains. And to find an answer, I suggest let's close our eyes and contemplate upon it. Let's contemplate upon where are we as souls, as consciousness, not as bodies. We know where the body is. We know the body is sitting in this chair in this room. Where are we as souls? What do we see around the soul inside? Do we see our own mind? Do we see how our senses are working? Do we see our body around us? And where are we? What else do we see around us? Let's actually see what's inside. Therefore, close your eyes. And get back into the center of consciousness inside your head, behind the eyes. 
at the third eye center, which is behind the two eyes, right at the third eye, which is middle of the back of the two eyes. Close your eyes, be there. Forget the body. Just think of your being there. Don't think of the head and the arms and the... They are sitting all right. Let them sit on the chairs. Let your body sit on the chair. Concentrate on finding out where you are in the head. What are you doing? What are you up to? Not your body, but you. Look at your own self and your own actions and your own thoughts coming and then leave the thoughts aside and see, can you see your own thoughts floating around? Get to your real self and see what is around you and where are you? One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes. Look this way. Looks like some of you had a good experience. Did anybody have a good experience? Oh, good. Thank you. That sounds good. You were able to discover the space, beautiful space, to be in from where you can get all your awareness. We have a few questions at this time, then we'll have a lunch break and reassemble to continue our journey within to reality and our true home where we are. Any questions right now on what we are doing? Any problem that is coming up with these kind of exercises of going within? No question, no comment. Yes. Well, there weren't any immediate ones. One from much earlier when I didn't want to interrupt and it's connected to now. Uh, you mentioned the um, senses that comprise the astral body, which is the senses themselves and not the sense organs. And what I was curious about is, is it possible during ordinary waking consciousness to be very much aware of those senses as well, to have them operating so that you're not just perceiving through your ordinary physical senses, but through the senses that transcend the ordinary senses all at the same time? Certainly. Not only, not only is it possible, we are all using it all the time to some degree. Sometimes it gets more heightened. Other times we call it imagination. We think we are going there. We, we think, oh, what happened there? We think we are remembering something. If I were to tell you now, walk up and touch these flowers and go back, can you do it? Can you in your imagination, while sitting on the chairs, just feel that you're walking up and touching these flowers and going back, smelling. Can you do it? How many can do it? Please raise your hands. You just use your sensory astral body. You just use your astral body in a very small degree. Why do I call it small degree? Because the bulk of your attention remained into the reality of the physical body, maybe 90-95%. And 5% traversed in this imagination, which is again the sensory system. Otherwise, how could you be traveling and seeing these flowers? You use the sensory perceptions while you came in an imaginary journey here. So you, even on a day-to-day -day basis, use part of that system of separating the sensory body and using it while you're still in the physical body, without using physical organs. But sometimes it can be heightened. If the attention goes into that sensory system, sometimes it can be heightened to the extent you can actually feel that you are really gone away and this is not your, yourself, it's only a body. That can happen too. It seems that sometimes, not always, during ordinary consciousness, uh, I perceive what I'm going to call the energy field surrounding surrounding things, uh, human bodies, uh, plants. Uh, sometimes I see in color and sometimes I just see like a, a clear energy. Trans yeah, the astral, astral vision, which is beyond this vision, can open up when you put more attention into it, even while you're still in the physical body. Which means the physical body is using physical sense organs and sensory systems are operating through the body. If they move out, your attention is in that, especially if you are spiritually inclined and have been practicing, you can see things without even moving out of this body. While you're in this body, you can see things which would normally be perceptible only to the astral body. I have a suspicion of that, about, about this regarding why we don't all see things like this all the time. My suspicion is that when we were little, we did, and we were talked out of it because we said, oh, I see this and I see that, and mommy and daddy said, no, you don't, and they were bigger and knew better, so we stopped, we stopped letting ourselves see those things. We just denied them, and after a while, they, we stopped being sensitive to it.
Yeah, our, pa- our parents made us civilized. Yeah. <laughs> our parents helped us to grow up. It didn't start only from that by saying that you are seeing ghosts and you are not seeing real things. It started earlier when they put the rattles in front of us and said, look, this is the real world. And we who were enjoying ourselves like newborns, having bliss inside, were made to force open, throw our attention out and con- and continue to have this out- outward flow of attention from that point onwards. So they helped us a lot in making this world a reality. You are right. Any other question or comment? Yes. I have a comment. I guess um, if I may share some of the best experience I just had. Um, in the past when I have meditated or whatever with through my attention, I've had um, experiences which were I could write about, were very interesting, and were very meaningful to me. And I felt very fortunate. And today I felt more fortunate, yet I had no experience I could write about. I just was, and it just felt so correct that um, the first time I can ever remember feeling so good about nothing, so to speak. <laughs> but it wasn't nothing. That, that was nothing. At, at this point today, I feel like it's everything, what I experienced, yet I couldn't write about it. Okay, anybody else want to share of today's experience? There will be more experiences, of course, later in the day. And you can share more later on. We'll have a break for lunch and we'll reassemble here. It's 12 o'clock, what time? About 1.30? It's okay? You'll be able to eat and relax and uh, share and talk to each other within an hour and a half? So we meet at 1.30 again here. Thank you. How many are happy with what's going on? Oh, I got a good percentage. Thank you. How many are unhappy? They're not candid enough. There were two in the lobby, but I shot them. How many of you are initiated by a perfect living master? Thank you. How many of you are sure you are initiated by a perfect living master? Thank you. How many of you are waiting for initiation by a perfect living master? Okay. Thank you. It doesn't apply to you. How many of you of you came here and had a question in your mind when you came to the workshop and you feel the question has already been answered? That applies to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, we'll uh, proceed with this workshop uh, by by my making a brief reference at this point to what is it that I was talking about a little while ago, initiation. Initiation is a much abused word. I saw uh, some... Uh, News stories, magazine stories on TV, where initiation is a satanic process. They call it initiation too. And it can be a very horrible experience for people and they still call it initiation. I don't want to use the word after seeing those tapes on the TV. And I I feel that uh, we should correctly understand what we mean by initiation by a perfect living master. Initiation by a perfect living master means the internal switch of our attention towards the sound current, which is the vibrating force of consciousness that goes through every level of awareness, starting from totality right up to this physical stage. There's a melody, a music, a very sweet, melodious sound going on in each one of us. It is not being created by physical systems, blood vessels or anything. It is being created by the vibration. The dynamics of that sound are contained in the consciousness itself. So even when other covers are taken off, that sound doesn't go. Therefore, the sound belongs to consciousness and not to the covers around it. But the sound changes. We listen to it and it looks different 
depending upon the cover we have upon ourselves. It's like the flow of water through a waterfall. It sounds different. The same water goes through the plains over rocks and we go through rafting through the rocks. It sounds different. It goes through stillness and it sounds different. It goes through little raindrops. It sounds different. It goes into the sea. It sounds different. But the water is the same. In the same way, this sound current or the melody of the consciousness is the same. But when it passes through different covers of illusions, it sounds different. It has different sounds, but the one we are most familiar with are the sounds immediately above us. And those sounds are the sound of the big bell. Dong, dong, an echoing bell sound. Very sweet, very melodious. That bell sound is going on inside all of us. If we paid attention to it, to pay attention to that sound, there is one requirement. We should be quiet. But being quiet is very difficult. Being quiet doesn't mean not speaking with your mouth. It also means not speaking with your mind. But when we sit alone, we say, now is it the sound? When did it come? No, let me do something else. The mind is babbling all the time. When are we quiet? If you can be quiet just for a moment, one moment, you'll hear the sound. It doesn't take too long. And sometimes you don't know the melody of the sound, its vibration, because it's coming from a different dimension. It's coming even now, it's coming all the time. Once you start getting used to the sound, you can keep on doing your day-to-day -day work and the sound will always be there, you can hear it. That sound is the, is the presence, is the manifest form of your own consciousness. Consciousness becomes consciousness by becoming conscious of something. That means creation is needed for consciousness to exist. But consciousness can exist per se because of the sound, which is the manifestation of the experiencer, not the experience. The sound is very important. And that sound is what leads us back. Now this bell sound, this ringing of bells, a periodic sound, like a vibration, this bell sound, it's not, a, it's not like a hit like this. This is too coarse. The bell makes it more subtle. And a very delicate, subtle bell is the kind of sound it comes. But it can be quite loud. Especially if you concentrate your attention at third eye center and become unconscious. That means your body gets lifted up and you, don't, you are not aware of your bottom and you feel you're in air. At that time, it becomes louder. And when it becomes loud, that sound has a pull in it, like it can pull you, like the vibration carries you with it. There's like a wave, and the wave with which you can go up. So that pulling quality of that sound makes it the real vehicle for going quickly to higher levels of consciousness. You can either go by the very hard yogic practices of mantra, repetition of words, trying to pull your thoughts back, fighting with the mind, or you can go the easy way by clinging to the sound and you cling to the sound and the sound takes you up. The sound is very important. The bell sound has been recognized by the spiritual leaders of every culture and every tradition in the world. When we go and see a church building and a round dome on there and a sound and we ring the bells inside, why did we put that? Why didn't we put a drum inside? Why did the churches decide to ring bells and not, not play drums? Because the dome was supposed to represent the head. The church was supposed to be a physical replica of the true church, of the true temple, which is the body. All scriptures say that. Not Christianity. Not only Hinduism. Not only the Islamic culture. Every culture is said that the human body is the true temple of the living God. Other gods may be concepts, but there is a living God who is conscious and gives us consciousness that lives in this temple we call this body. So from time to time in history, temples and churches and mosques and other places of worship have been constructed in a state where it resembles like the head of a human being. When human beings wore strange kind of headgears, they put steeples and they made the churches also like that. The, the architecture flowed 
from the experience of the actual practitioners of spirituality. Not practitioners of religion, practitioners of true meditation, of going within the real temple. And to remind us constantly, they put these artificial reminders around us, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget the temple and don't forget the bells. We forgot both. We thought it's the bricks and the mortar and the stone that is making it hallowed and sanctified. What was making it hallowed and sanctified was the resemblance to the true temple. And the sound was the same that we tried to put in there and ring the bells there. But those bells have to be told by somebody. And you don't toll them all the time. But these bells are going on all the time. The bells in consciousness ring all the time, even when we die. They still ring. There is a continuity. Continuity of life is through the melody of consciousness. When initiation takes place, it is the inner attention of the seeker that's switched, that it should be linked with the inner sound within. So when the seeker rises to a state of consciousness through what looks like outside effort and meditation and so on, the pull from inside takes it up and sounds like a very good sound and the sound emits light and the light has a form and we don't know what form that is. We can see a form in the light. You see the radiant form of some being is there. So many people report in near-death experiences that they had a divine form they could not recognize, but there was a divine form bathed in light, that radiant form. When you are initiated by a perfect living master, he makes sure that when you go in meditation to third eye center with the sound, you can see the radiant form of that master. So you are sure who you are seeing. You get a convincing proof that you are on the right track, you see the same person. If you see someone else, you are advised to ignore it, because that is made up by your mind. Only when you see the radiant form of the perfect living master who has initiated you, do you come to know that you now have a companionship and you have overcome the stage of loneliness. We all have our state of loneliness and we are going through that state of loneliness. This loneliness is not overcome by short-term relationships outside in this world. We try to pacify ourselves by these relationships outside. We think this will be enough to take care of, of our loneliness. It doesn't work like that. It works for a while and then there is a misunderstanding. And then there is hatred. Then we say that you've been deceived by the people. You've been exploited. You've been used. And you use all these words to describe your state. Then you find that the loneliness could not be overcome by worldly relationships and connections here. The real solution to loneliness is to find the radiant form of the master within. When you get that radiant form within and you stabilize that form, it comes and goes because our attention is not strong enough to hold it. When the attention becomes strong enough to hold the radiant form, it is like having a permanent friend with you 24 hours of the day, 7 days of a week, every day of the year throughout your life. There's nothing like it. You never feel alone. You have a permanent friend in your pocket virtually. That is the minimum guarantee by getting initiated by a perfect living master. That you get somebody and you can talk to the form. It's not only visual. You talk and walk together like a friend. And then you understand the meaning of what does it say? I can walk with you and talk with you. And that, that makes sense when you have that kind of experience within. Initiation by a perfect living master guarantees that you will have the master with you at all times. <clears throat> at the time of death, the master will appear, take care of you and control the destiny, not allow the forces of death to control it. He'll modify the destiny in your presence so you know how he's working his way so that you get out of this mess as quickly as possible on the way according to the teachings he has given in this physical form. It's a great reassurance. But the masters also tell us that if we get initiated, we should check out if we are initiated. Just to be told we are initiated and some mantra has been told and some words have been given to us. Even a hoax can do it. A con man can do it. There is no proof of initiation. You want to be sure you are initiated, go with it. Check out with the radiant form and see 
if you have been so connected to the sound current within that you, your journey is all set and taken care of. So therefore, initiation by a perfect living master means a lot more than merely being told a few words to repeat. And initiation takes place at that level, astral level, what we call the tenth door. The tenth door is so called because of the nine apertures on the body that take our attention out. The two eyes, the two ears, the two nostrils, the mouth, the two lower apertures. These nine apertures in the body are almost like doors opening outward. All these doors take our attention out into the world. And we are using these doors constantly to create outside relationships. The tenth door behind the eyes is called the door that opens inward. The door that we knock and go on the right path. It's the tenth door where the initiation takes place. Therefore, it's not an external physical thing at all. It's an internal thing that opens the door to your own inner self. It's all right that in these workshops I give you some sampling of what you can expect and it's nice. But the real thing is when you get initiated and follow the instructions and put your attention on the tenth door and go within and see the radiant form of the master and have a conversation like we converse here, you can say, yes, I am on the true spiritual path now. Initiation is not a small thing. It's a very big thing. Once initiated, you are in good hands and will not the journey will not end from that point unless you reach your own home. Even if you want to get rid of initiation, you can't get rid of initiation. You can leave the master, the master won't leave you. You can be angry with your master, he won't get angry with you. You can kill your master, he'll still love you and take you home. That's the relationship with the perfect living master. It's not a small thing. It's a very deep relationship. It goes, comes from our true home and goes back to our true home. So when I say that initiation is of that great importance, I want you to understand that you who are assembled here are marked souls. You have been designated to get initiation. Whether you raise your hands or not, you are designated. I knew that when you entered here. And therefore, one day you will be initiated. But some of you who do not know may have already been initiated. I remember that's a GM story for Jewel. I remember there was a man who had intense seeking in his heart. He lived quite far away from the Dera in India where Great Master used to live. But he had heard about Great Master and wanted to go and get initiated. The desire in his heart was so strong, he missed Great Master, even by seeing his picture, even by the contemplation of what he would look like. He fell in love with him. He couldn't help loving him. And he didn't know how it was happening. But he felt the great pull and wanted to go and see Great Master. So he made the long trip by bullock cart, by on foot, on train, again on by foot. Ultimately, after a month, he reached the Great Master. And when he saw the beautiful face of the Great Master, this lovely white beard, shining eyes, and so much love radiating from the face, he was so pleased. And Great Master said, welcome, welcome. And he felt so happy. He said, Master, initiate me. And Great Master said, what again? What happened a month ago? <laughs> the story shows that initiation need not take place as a ceremon ceremonial feature. You don't have a ceremony to have initiation. Initiation takes place when the Master takes responsibility for you because of your intense seeking for the truth. The requirement of initiation is not to fill an application and wait in line. The requirement is you should have intense seeking in your heart. You should feel so strongly. I want to get the truth. I want to know the real thing. And I am so much in devotion and love for the truth and for the, for the Lord that fills you up. And a master whose marked sheep you are will initiate you. And may confirm later on through meditation that you were initiated at that time. I am making this point, telling this GM story. First, in response to Jewel's request. And secondly, say that we are not sure. It's not a ceremonial thing. You could be initiated when you have had no idea. And you could be not initiated even when you have gone through the whole process. Because there is no verification that what you got inside. You don't know who the guru was who initiated you. 
So you have to be sure of initiation by going within and seeing the radiant form of the master. But what about the mind fooling us by making imaginary faces? It may happen that we sit in meditation and we see the form of the master by our own imagination. And the mind fools us. There is the radiant form. Looks pretty radiant. Maybe, maybe it will be more later, but looks pretty good to me now. The mind may be making it all up. And there's no initiation at all. What do you do then? They have some safeguards. These perfect living masters who appear in this world, in our life, for our sake, not for their sake. They don't come to make a living out of us. They come to give us, not to take from us. These perfect living masters, when they come, although they have come like ordinary human beings, like us, although they are using ordinary physical bodies like us, although they take birth and die, whether on the floor or on the cross, like us, although they follow the normal rules of physical systems, they eat, drink and feed themselves like us, although they may marry and have children like us, they retain a few significant differences which cannot be imitated by anybody else. One of those differences is their eyes and forehead cannot be imitated even by an imagination in the mind. It's a great safeguard. The mind can figure out, if the mind wants to think of a perfect living master, the mind can make up the whole face except this portion. Whenever the mind wants to see the eyes and the forehead of a perfect living master, it shakes and breaks up. You cannot even see. Any other face you can clearly visualize. Therefore, when you can actually visualize the eyes and forehead of a perfect living master, the perfect living master is there. There is a safeguard so that you are not fooled by your own mind. There are a few other safeguards also, which at the time of initiation you are taught and you can practice so you are absolutely sure that there is no hanky-panky going on on the way that the mind and the, the negative forces are not fooling you or some other entity is not fooling by coming in the middle. So these are all part of the process of going to the third eye center and proceeding on your spiritual journey from there. I brought this to your notice because some of you may not have known it. Now we'll go back to finding that space from where the journey starts. Let me remind you, if you can be still, mentally still, mentally quiet, at that point behind the eyes, you'll get answers to all your questions. If you can if you can be still and not move from the third eye center, you'll be filled with light. If you can forget these eyes while you're inside and stay in the center with the single eye, you can remember that, that those words have validity. If thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be filled with light. It is not, it's not a hyperbole, it's not a general statement, it's a literal statement. And if you have a single eye within, that means your whole attention is focused on being there. You'll see light of an immensity and intensity you've never seen outside. And yet it will not hurt your eyes. It's a soft light. It is so soft that you can be like a cloud of light. It doesn't hurt. It's intense. It's very white and strong. It doesn't hurt. As you go along, along with the sound and the light at different levels of consciousness, you find the light changing in appearance. For example, at the causal stage, at the causal stage where you begin to feel the universal mind and left sensory systems behind, the light takes on an orangish, reddish hue, like a sunrise or sunset, that kind of. But supposing you saw a rising sun or a setting sun, a sun that looks big and is still bright but does not hurt, and stretch that sun and make it the whole sky. That's what the sky looks like there. And you can fly in that sky and see so many things. So it has a visual impact. All these stages have a visual impact. Visual does not mean sensory. Let me clarify. This vision I'm talking of is different from sight. Seeing is different. It breaks you into seeing and other things. That vision is intact. It's like perceiving. But the perception is visual. There are two things that go with you in every stage. One is mirth, which is the power of seeing or vision. 
and surth, the attention, which is the power of listening. You never lose your power of listening, and you never lose your power of seeing. And these go and play, play up an, a, an externalized version. At every stage, it looks like it's externalized, even though what is happening is inside, it looks like it's happening around, and you can see it. Just like this life is all happening inside, but looks like it's outside. At every level, you can see its manifest form, which can be visually seen through nirt and can be audibly heard like surt. That surt is really attention, attention of the soul. The attention of the soul has the capacity to listen. All physical experience is coming to us through that listening device. We have a narrator sitting with us, the mind. It is a good narrator, a commentator. It comments upon all experiences all the time. Now you are going there, now you are seeing this fellow, now what is he doing, now is he speaking, now he said this, now we ate this, now we ate breakfast, now we ate lunch. That mind never stops telling us what is happening. We don't, doesn't the mind realize that we can know we are eating? The truth is we can't. So the mind is doing a good job. It's the mind that tells us we are eating and we know we are eating. Otherwise, how would we know we are eaten? The mind is doing a good job to make all five sense perceptions active. The mind speaks out in words, in a language, audible to the attention of the soul, which makes the soul participate in all the experiences of the sense perceptions here. So this power of the mind to speak and the power of the soul to listen is basic to shifting our attention to the soul, which means if we stop speaking and start listening, we are moving more towards our own center. If we could really do it mentally, not merely outside, even outside helps. I can tell you in this world that you speak less and listen more, you are much better off. But inwardly, it's an immense difference. If you can sit in your space, in the third eye center, and don't speak but listen, you have nothing to listen. If the babble of the mind stops, that's the only speaker inside. And you still listen, you listen nothing but the melody of your own self. That melody, that sound is so beautiful, so it's a resonance. You can't even call it sound. It's a kind of a resonance that surrounds you and pulls you and takes care of you. It has the power, it has the power of the master. It is the true form of a perfect living master. Perfect living masters are not really human. We look at them as human because they have to help us. When we go within, we see them in the radiant form. When we go higher up, we find that was not their true form. Like our true form is not this body, but is our soul. The true form of the master is not the body of the master, nor the radiant form of the master, but that melody that sounds within. That's their true form. And that's arising from our own consciousness. So master is an extension of our own consciousness. And this we realize as we keep going on the spiritual path. Remember all this beautiful treasure I talk about, spiritual wealth, is inside each one of us and can be accessed by withdrawing attention to the third eye center. I suggested before lunch that let's go and find that space and don't and forget about everything else. But I suppose some of you might have tried and seen that your mind keeps on babbling and creates a distraction. Did anyone find that? Well, it's commonplace. Therefore, let's find a device to take care of it. Those initiated can use a mantra, can use the simran, can use the repetition of words. Those who are not initiated can coin up a, a simple phrase and repeat it so that the bland phrase takes care of the thoughts. The idea is don't let the mind think. If it has to think, let it think on a set pattern, on a beautiful pattern, on a prayer, a short prayer. A short prayer can be repeated again and again to keep the mind busy. If the mind is kept busy with that, at least it will not distract us more than is necessary. If you hear the sound, stop everything and listen to the sound. If the sound tends to fade away, get back to repetition till the sound comes again. If you see the light, see it from a distance. If you try to approach the light, the light fades away because you are seeing the light by being in the center, not because of following the light. The light will follow you, you don't have to follow the light. You have to be in the center. The light is there because of your being in the center. So stay in the center at all times. And if different forms 
and figures come. Have any one of you seen during your meditation sessions different faces coming and floating around in front of you? Which you could not recognize? Did you see any faces? You were not even sure who they are. Well, they are faces of people you have known in past lives. None are strangers. There are no strangers floating. But when we do meditation, a lot of these old memories are pulled up and float in front of us. If that happens, ignore them. Let them just go. Don't try to recognize, don't try to follow them because that shifts you from the center. Let them float like you are watching a TV, giant screen TV. And they come and they go. Let them float by. If patterns come, colors come, waterfalls falling, lights, little stars sprinkling here or there, if any of these experiences come, let them come and go. Don't follow them, don't, because when you follow them, your attention shifts towards them and loses the center. So see from a distance, relax. Take a nice chair. Do you use a chair in your meditation? Chair inside. You can pick up a nice chair behind the eyes. Beautiful, the best comfortable chair. Sit in the chair, imaginary chair. It costs you nothing because it's imaginary. So you take a beautiful chair, relax in that. And while relaxing in the chair, watch the scene going on. But constantly ensuring that your attention is on the center in the middle of the head. So use all these means to stay in the center. And whatever comes in front, ignore it. Just watch it and let it go. Don't hold on to anything. When you will let them go, you will let go of a lot of things that are messing you up today and help you a lot. Shall we begin? Any question on what I am saying? Any question before we start? Okay, close your eyes and begin. Two, three, four, five. Open your eyes. Look this side. Did any one of you fall asleep? Okay, it's not no, normal. It's natural. It's natural to fall asleep because the tendency is the same. Every time we collect attention, the tendency to sleep is very strong. I'm surprised more of you didn't sleep. Maybe it was too short. If I'd extended it longer, more would have gone to sleep. But the tendency is the same. When you pull attention there, it tries to slip into the throat center, take you to sleep. Any of you enjoyed the session? Oh, good. Thank you. Prior to our break for lunch, sharing, we had a little sharing about two sessions. One in which more was seen and less gained. Second in which less was seen and more gained. Normal. It's not unusual. The spiritual growth is not directly related to how much you see. Spiritual growth is related to how much your awareness expands and how much love and devotion comes up in you. That's the measure of spiritual growth and not the spectacle that you see in meditation. Sometimes you can see a lot and still end up with the same level of doubt and so on. Sometimes you can see very little or see nothing at all and still get a feeling that you got filled up and you got what you came for. So they are not related to each other. In fact, there is a story of uh, my master's master. Great master's master was called Babaji. And Babaji, uh, his, his guru was another Swami, Swamiji in Agra, about four, 500 miles away from where he lived. So this Babaji felt a very strong pull in his heart for his master. He felt love and devotion in his heart. And he felt that he was missing his master. So he wrote a letter. Beloved master, I miss you very much. I want to see you. I can't help it, but I, I can't help remaining away from you. Please give me permission to come and see you. He wrote a beautiful love letter, full of love and devotion. And he wanted to see his master. He mailed the letter and waited for a month. Sometimes you have to wait for long periods for replies from these masters. But after a month or so, sometimes they don't even reply. They wait for you to get in the replies. But after a month or so, he did get a letter in the mail from his master Swamiji, who said, my beloved child, Babu, 
Jamal Singh, which was his name. I am very happy to receive your letter and to know that your soul is traveling in the higher regions. He opened this letter. He said, my soul goes nowhere. I just wanted permission to go and see my master. What has he written? So he wrote another letter. He said, beloved master, I got your letter. It must be a mistake. My soul goes nowhere. I don't go anywhere. I'm just missing you. I just want to see you. And please give me permission to come and see you. We waited another month and a second reply came saying, my beloved son, Jamal Singh, I am very happy to receive your second letter and to know that your soul is going in the higher regions. But so far as the question of your coming to see me is concerned, come next month in the first week. So he got permission, but baffled by this reference to soul going up, he took these letters with him to his master. And he went there and he said, Master, you wrote these two letters to me. They must be directed to somebody else. Because my soul goes nowhere. I was just feeling like longing for your darshan, to see you. I wanted to look at you. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to come here. But what is this reference to the soul? Sometimes these masters laugh loudly because they see more than we can see. So he said, come with me. There were about 10 or 12 disciples of his sitting there. He said, come with me inside. Let's sit here in meditation now. So they both went into the little cottage and sat for half an hour, closing their eyes and, you know, doing virtually third eye center and going within. And after half an hour, they were both emerged to the rest of the gathering of 10, 15 people. Then Swamiji said, Now, my son, Jamal Singh, tell me, when I wrote those letters to you, was your soul going up in the higher regions? He said, yes, sir, yes, master, it was. And Swamiji said, I am not saying if this soul went up today in meditation to the higher regions. I am asking you, when you wrote these letters to me, was your soul going in the higher regions at that time? He said, yes, master, it was at that time. Then Swamiji turned to the other people who couldn't understand this conversation. And he said, this nirth and surth, the power to see and the power to pay attention, don't always go together. And you can go blindfolded. Master sometimes encourage that you go to certain experiences blindfolded so that the inner distraction does not take you away from the path of love and devotion. The true spiritual path that takes you above the mind is a path of love and devotion. It is not a path of the intellect. It is not a path of stubborn yoga. It is not a hatha yoga. It is not something that you have to do by force. It's, uh, it is with utter love and devotion that humility of love and devotion that takes you to the highest levels above the mind. To create that for a person who has too much curiosity of even the subtle inner spheres, the masters will sometimes blindfold you and take you through them, through those stages. All you feel is intense longing to see the master. All you feel is great love and devotion. All you feel is an awareness that there is a truth waiting for you. All you feel is some fulfillment but not the visual spectacle. And when you are taken second time to the same stage, you also see the visual spectacle of which you were blindfolded. So this was an actual example of what happened. So I am just mentioning it here that it is not necessary that every time the spectacle should be the same or should even occur. The spiritual path is measured by the love and devotion that grows. My teacher, great master, he said to me that meditation is not a means to go within. Yeah, I mean, he was very radical. I must say, great master was a radical master. He, he said something which many would attack, the yogis would attack him. He said, meditation is not a means of going within. It is like a thermometer. A thermometer does not give you fever. It measures the fever. Meditation doesn't take you within. It measures how far you have gone. What takes you within is love and devotion. Total love and devotion with humility without meditation can take you as far as with meditation. But meditation will tell you if you are going within. It's a measure. So we can sometimes overemphasize the importance of the means for getting the end. Meditation is a means. It's not an end by itself. We don't do meditation for the sake of meditation. 
we do meditation as a vehicle of our love and devotion. Remember the path of the perfect living masters is a path that transcends the mental intellectual levels and therefore is founded upon love and devotion. Therefore, if you have no love and devotion, say goodbye to their path. You can be a good philosopher, you can be an author, you can write books, you can... You want to deal with people, your ego, which is the front piece of the mind. The mind has a face. The face of the mind is your ego. I want to do this. Who are you to tell me this? I said first. You did it to me first. This is a simple, ordinary language of the face of the mind, expressed through vocal cords. It can be expressed in writing too. Anger, anger, ego, haughtiness, greed, mine, yours. All this comes as the front of the mind. When you're dealing with people in this way, you're not dealing with spiritual path at all. You're dealing with the face of the mind. And this mind then constantly brings up all the other things that keep you down. When you deal with people with love, you put the mind aside. You put the ego aside. But if you want to say intellectually, I want to put my ego aside in order to experience the truth, you can never do it. Because the very power you are trying to use to push the ego itself is ego. You are trying to say, I will do it. I let, let me see what the mind does to me. I am going to beat it. This I is the same mind, same, same trying to engage in a self battle so that you are totally distracted in the battle of the eyes. All the eyes being your own mind. Where is love and devotion? If there is something in us, in our consciousness, that puts the eye and the ego and the mind on the back seat, it is love and devotion. When you fall in love, you forget about the eye. Love is the only experience where the consciousness of the beloved can make you forget where you are. Attachment is not the same thing. Love is different from attachment. When you have attachment, it is I and you. I did this to you. What do you do? What, what have you done for me lately? It's all a reciprocal system. That What have I done for you? What you have done for me? You disappointed me. I loved you more. You loved me less. This I and you is attachment. There is no love in that. When there is love, the face of the beloved, the, the attraction of the beloved, the power of the beloved, so fills you. You have no time to think of who you are. You're too much filled up with the beloved. This identification of your own self with the beloved is love. Love is the only time when you can forget yourself and your ego. I do not know any other way. I have tried to examine all systems of meditation available on this earth. I have been to more gurus than any one of you would ever have a chance in your lifetime. I have not found any other way of putting this ego on the back seat except by the process of love, true love. True love which makes you identify with the beloved. That true love, the identifying with the beloved is when you forget your I, you don't know where I is. And you, you, you alone remain. That's love. And love is what can take you above the ego, therefore above the mind. Therefore the path of the perfect living masters has always been founded in love and devotion, which is a meditational aspect of love. Devotion is no different. Devotion is looking upon meditation with love. And intellectual meditation is to think out. Now, let me see where exactly this center is talking about. And let me now figure out how far is it is. Let me now work out this. When you start working out logically things in your head, you get nothing. You can spend an hour and come out tired of the logic, mentally tired, physically tired sometimes too. And when you are trying to do it physically only, that I am still in the mind, let me see in the body, my body may not move and I have to make sure I am still in the body and the knee is hurt and the ache and the foot is not in the right place, all your attention is in the knee and the foot, how will you get to the third eye center? So it is not the physical or the mental gymnastics that we play that is called meditation. True meditation is when you sit there with love and devotion, forgetting everything except the beloved. And the beloved and his face is in front of you. Which is one, uh, one more reason for having a perfect living master in this world, a human form. Because we can 
basically only love a human form. We can be attached to everything else. We can be attached to birds, beasts, bees, chairs, cars, ideas, diagrams. We can be attached to anything. But love is for another human being. So when we see that spirituality personifying in a human being, it makes it easier for us to have our spiritual love focused upon a spiritual beloved in the form of our master. We use that in the East all our all these ages. That without the Guru's face, what do you love? What do you put your devotion on? On your concept? On your idea? That's your own mind. You are loving your own mind. If you want to love the spiritual truth, look at the spiritual truth in the face of one who has crossed the mind. And then you can fix yourself in an attitude of love and devotion. I want to emphasize the importance of love and devotion in meditation to make it successful. Use it now in the next session. Now when we close our eyes, don't merely try to figure out where the third eye center is. Most of you must have figured out by now. But relax there with love and devotion for the beloved. Look at the face of the beloved. Let no other face come because the face of the beloved is in front of you. Let no other idea come because you're busy with your devotion. This devotional aspect of sitting at the third eye center is the secret of good meditation. I want you to practice it now. If you have, if you have no beloved, create one temporarily for this workshop. Anyone you can love. Love is a great power, the most powerful thing in this universe. Most powerful things in earth and heaven, anywhere. So with that devotion, attitude of love, and seeing the face of the beloved, and everything you say, once you are at the third eye center, express your love in any way you want. But don't leave the center. Stay at the center so that you have greater awareness and more answers to your questions. But use love as the principal vehicle of your worship of the Lord in the third eye center behind. Close your eyes and begin. Don't forget love and devotion is the key.